Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name is Chris Kroger. I'm the Associate Dean of Engineering and Undergraduate Student Services in the McKelvey School of Engineering. And it is my great pleasure to welcome up Dean Aaron Bobick, the Dean of the McKelvey School of Engineering. This is your, is this coming into your eighth year now? Eighth year. So um, he is He's going to, he's got some great thoughts for you that he'd like to share. And then what I'll do is share some of the essential items that I'll be talking to your sons and daughters about tomorrow morning. And then we'll have a panel of distinguished folks to come up here and answer some of your questions. So we thank you for taking the time to, to be here this morning. And most importantly, for having your sons and daughters come to Washington University. Please give a warm welcome to Dean Aaron Bobbitt. I'm from New York, so I don't usually use a mic, but um, I've been told that it's uh, not everybody's willing to share that they're having trouble hearing, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Also, the last time we did this, which was three years ago, um, uh, this part of the stage was elevated, which made it so I didn't have to keep looking like this, but I, I don't like being up there, so I'm, I'm going to talk to all of you here. Um, so I thought Chris was first going to say, welcome, <laughs> instead of introducing some guy. Uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, this is a uh, this is an interesting time in a parent's life. My kids are uh, uh, let's see, 31, 28, and 26. So uh, been there, done that. Uh, how many of you is this your first child going to school? Whoa! And that's why you're actually at the orientation. <laughs> For your second and third kid, it's like yeah, okay, uh, have a great time. I dropped our first daughter off at NYU and it was fine moving in. And then there was that time I could still remember on the curb by West 14th Street. And, you know, I cried. Uh, third child at Colorado State. Uh, somebody cried, um, but uh, not me. Anyway, so first of all, uh, welcome. Uh, I just have a few things that I want to share with you. And then I will turn it over to people who actually know something uh, about the uh, dealing with the students on a really on an everyday basis as engineering students. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is simply say, especially to all you first timers, thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with your kid. I know, like I said, from experience that this is a non-trivial decision on your part. And there are all sorts of factors that go into it. There are all these sort of early objective factors that, you know, gee, what are the other students going to be like? Is this a place where I think my student will thrive? Uh, how well do they think about everything from careers to coaching and all that kind of stuff? But then as you get closer to this drop-off point, you start to say, uh, is my kid going to be okay? And I think this morning you met with uh, Chancellor Martin and Anna Gonzalez, who's our uh, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And their job really is to talk explain to you everything the university does to make sure your kid is okay. But primarily from a life perspective, the coaching, the, the, the engagement, the residence, the, the, the support, mental health um, uh, the facilities and resources that we have, uh, a bunch of things that really have to do with their life. Our job here today is to tell you a little bit about why your kid's going to be okay in their academics. And in a little while, you're going to hear from a, a representative. Oh, there was a whole bunch of people up there just a, a minute ago, and Chris will put them up there again. These are, these are folks in engineering student services whose job every day, every day, is to ensure that your child succeeds in their academics and also connect them to other resources as needed. Uh, I won't say that we have the best undergraduate student services group in the on the campus because it would not be polite for me to say that, but we do. And I think you'll, you'll hear from that. So that's the first thing I wanna say. Second thing, a little bit, Chris will talk a little bit to you about uh, what we do in engineering and how we do it. Um, and I just wanna say that when I describe to, to folks and, and parents, you may have heard me say this if you visited during one of the recruiting or perspective times, um, you know, at first, there's this first layer uh, that you can think of that we basically teach students the fundamentals of whatever engineering discipline they're in. 
right? So they're going to, you know, if you're a chemical engineer, you're going to know your thermodynamics because frankly, you're not any useful, you're not any use to a company or to a researcher doing chemical engineering if you don't understand that. And so there are these very specifics. But if you abstract away a little bit from that, what we really teach at, at the engineering school, actually at any good engineering school, is how you take a problem, decompose it into its parts, into its elements, and then you go after them one at a time. You knock them down. This is what engineers do. I, I'm, I, I like to say that engineering, we don't worry too much about the options we wish we had, all right? which is both a, a, a strength and sometimes a liability, right? Sometimes engineers, and we work hard to try to get around this, don't think strategically enough, which is all about creating option, creating new options and then taking them. Early in engineering, you think about which options to execute. As you move later, you think about creating new options and, and, and uh, working on those. And so if you abstract away a little bit further yet, what we're really teaching students your students, your children, our students, uh, is to be fearless. Engineering at Wash U, some, if you talk to non-engineering students, they'll tell you it's hard because they don't understand how students could possibly do like that math stuff. But if you talk to our students, they won't tell you that it's hard. They'll tell you that it's a lot. And it is. There is a lot of stuff there. And one of the things that your kids are going to have to do is figure out about time management because you know it, it's really a lot. But you know, at the end of the day, we're teaching them to sort of that there's no problem that they can't attack. So that brings me to just two things that I want to share, and this really has to do with you. Number one, your students have all selected a major, or they think they have a major in mind. By the way, I'm just going to ask this now, and it's okay to raise your hand. How many parents here, students are actually in a different school, but they're thinking about transferring to engineering and you want to find out about it? We got a couple, one, two, three. All right. I will also tell you that last time I did this, we had a bunch of those hands. Turns out guidance counselors were telling students to apply to ArtSci or something else, get in, it was easier, and then transfer to engineering. Not my problem. Uh, uh, but... Um, but for most of you, your students have already indicated that they are a specific major within engineering. For some of them, they know. For most of them, they don't know. Okay. I don't know how you think about being a chemical engineer when you're coming out of high school. Maybe your parent was involved, et cetera, whatever. Maybe you just liked chemistry. Maybe the idea of being able to create stuff that blows up really blows your mind. I don't know. But they may discover that there's this really cool thing called systems engineering. And nobody, almost nobody in high school has any idea what systems engineering is. And they're gonna say, wow, that's actually what I wanted to do. My friends are all taking courses I wanna do. And meanwhile, I'm spending time with like wet stuff and they don't like that. So they're gonna wanna think carefully about changing majors. And one of the things that people you're gonna hear from here are people who can give them a tremendous amount of advice of what that means. Including, by the way, you know, I really want to major in anthropology. And you're going to say, wait a minute, I sent you to do mechanical engineering. And they'll say, yeah, so mom, I can be employed or I can be happy. And you're going to say, hmm. Uh, <laughs> the reality is coming out of Wash U, they're going to, get, they're going to be employed. Uh, you need to understand that they need to be able to share with you their uncertainty, right? Even though they swore to you they were going to be a mechanical engineer like their father and their grandfather and their father before them, and if they're really unusual, their great 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 grandmother. Okay, so one, so the one thing I want to make sure you you think about is if they come to you with uncertainty about their choices, you need to be support them and not say, hey, wait a minute, you said you were going to do X. By the way, how many of your kids think they're pre-med? Oh, come on. It's 35% it's of you, okay? About half of them will come to their senses and not go to med school. Um, and you need to support them in that. So the last thing I want to tell you, and this is sort of as a parent, as faculty, as dean, um, one of my degrees, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics. 
uh, from MIT. So I can tell you with reasonable certainty that 50% of the students are gonna be in the bottom half of the class. Now, how many of you just thought, yeah, that's great, not my kid, okay? 50% of you, your kid is gonna be in the bottom half of the class. None of them have been there before. You have not been there before. So your kid's gonna get, is likely to get a C on some exam, and maybe that's never happened to them in a technical area before. And they're gonna be okay with it if you're okay with it. A lot of their friends are also getting C's, so they don't have to worry about how their friends feel. Their friends who are majoring in you know, Germanic languages can't understand how they can do any of this stuff, never mind, you know, get a C. The only people they're gonna be worried about telling that they got a C is going to be you. And so you have to be able to deal with that in a supportive way. I got a C, at MIT, there are no grades the first year, sophomore, first semester, uh, sophomore year, there was this compilers course that you have to take if you're a computer science major, I was math and computer science, and I really didn't like the course, so I, I didn't go very much. I figured I'd take the tests. I didn't really hand in the homework. Three weeks before the end of the class, I found out homework was 35% of the final grade. So I studied my butt off, did really, really well on the exam. Uh, my mom calls, because those days we mailed report cards home to parents pre-FERPA. And she says, well, you got two A's, you got this B. You, you got a C. I said, let me guess, 6035, that was the number of the course. She said, yeah. I said, yeah, I know, it was a terrible course. She said, you're going to be okay? I said, mom, you're going to be okay? And, you know, I did okay. So I, I need you to remember that. Don't share that with them now, okay? But, you know, if and when that happens, that's what you need to do. All right, so that's, that's all you're gonna hear from me. I will be sticking around. I'll be happy to take questions. It, it'll make more sense for me to take questions a little bit later. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and his organization, which like I said, their job is to make sure that in the academic world, your kids are gonna be okay. Thank you, Dean Bobbick. So what we're gonna do is just spend a little bit of time going over some slides that we're gonna go over with with your sons and daughters tomorrow morning. And then we're gonna have folks from our office come up here and answer your questions. The most important thing that we want is for you to feel like your questions are answered, that you've got a, a feel for what the support systems exist here for your sons and daughters. So the um, first thing that we do tomorrow morning when they join us is that we'll have in council come up. In council is our undergraduate student body, general student body that has overall oversight for the other student groups in terms of what they do too in the coordination. And we have what's called engineering induction where all the engineering students will uh, get an engineering McKelvey engineering school hat. And then we have them do the engineer's creed. They all stand, raise the right hand, and we do the creed together and it kind of forms a bonding moment. The engineering students over time have a really strong sense of identity as being part of McKelvey School of Engineering. And we wanna instill that very early on. That's a, that's a real advantage that we have within our school. And then we immediately start talking about what are the things that you need to do to be successful and happy and have some well-being while you're here. And these are all very common sense things that we talk about. Unfortunately, they're just not always common practice. When we talk to students who get into trouble at the end of an academic semester, which isn't really a huge number, so typically about 5% will end on academic probation or suspension compared to 40% who land on dean's list. But these are the factors that we know that if, they're, if they don't have good time management, if they don't know how to study, this is what will get them in trouble early on. And if we can head that off as quickly as we possibly can, that momentum will build in a positive direction, their mental health will be more positive, and they're gonna have better outcomes that they're really looking for. The one slide I don't have up here that I have immediately after 
this one with the students is that I mentioned Theodore Roosevelt's quote, comparison is the thief of joy because so much of their, their identity in terms of how they feel about themselves is related to how their roommate's doing and how the person sitting next to them in class is doing. And having that real sense of what's important to them as an individual, even more so compared to what's important to you, as Dean Bobbick mentioned, is, is important for them to have a sense of self in terms of what they're looking forward to accomplish in their own lives. And we talk about the, the factors why students choose Washington University. And we will cover these um, in some detail throughout the presentation with them. It is a very collaborative environment. It's been that way. I've been here for 32 years now. And it's been that way the entire time. The hard part, the competitive part of Washington University is getting in. This year, only 9% of our first year class was admitted into engineering. So it is a highly competitive process to get here. And the peer group that they're with is outstanding. They're gonna learn as much from each other in their homework and their problem sets that they do and their small group interactions often as they do from the faculty in the classroom. So they having that really strong peer group to rely on is an advantage for them and for their peers both. The, I'm gonna kind of skip around here a little bit. We, we do have a lot of students who combine studies, who do multiple things. I'll talk a bit more about that and you'll see some examples of that. Uh, the academic support I'll also talk about, but the high retention rates. We're incredibly proud of our retention rates here in McKelvey. You know, most state universities, the retention rate is 55% of the students who start as first year students will graduate with an engineering degree. Here, it's anywhere, depending upon the year, between 80 to 85% of our students who start as engineering students will graduate with an engineering degree. Those that don't stay in engineering, often it's because they fell in love with something else. They, you know, loved finance or art or history or something else. So we don't wanna stop them from uh, moving to other things. We wanna encourage them to move along, but we're not trying to eliminate anybody from staying here if they really wanna be here. One of the most important things is, to them, is for them to think bigger about what they can do with an engineering degree. It is an opportunity multiplier. Engineering is not a vocational training program. They're coming in how to think, how to problem solve, how to relate with others. You know, the math and science is crucial. I often think of engineering education in a, in a real broad general sense as a three layer cake. There is that basic math science layer they have to have, the engineering science layer, and then the engineering design. Now, that's an oversimplification and those layers do overlap with each other, but there's some, some truth to it. But we also want them to have at least 18 units of humanities and social science credit. And they have broad breadth to choose what they wanna do in terms of what they're taking. The, the music and the art class, we see a lot of our students in engineering wanting to do music related things, same parts of the brain involved in mathematics or involved in music. So it's not surprising that we see a lot of engineering students involved in music in some way. And then at the far right of the chart up there, or the slide are the different things that we see our students doing. Certainly a good number will do classical engineering type jobs that you think of. I'll have a few examples of that, but you know, it's usually around 30 or so students that go into medical school every year, MBA programs, maybe not right after graduation, but soon after law school. I know two mechanical engineers in the last five years that went to Harvard Law School. They decided they would rather be lawyers. Consulting companies love hiring the engineering students because of their problem solving skills and, and the focus that they have and not just technical consulting, but just general consulting and, and overall entrepreneurship, research type things that they might move into, management, finance. Um, one of our alums was back on campus a few years ago. He was a systems engineer. I asked him what he was doing. He said he was working in finance. I said, out of curiosity, how many of your coworkers in finance, how many of them had engineering degrees and how many of them had business degrees? He said that 80% of his coworkers were engineers that were working in finance where he was at. So really get them to think bigger about what they can do with that engineering degree long-term. And a great example of that, and it's kind of cool to be able to promote that we had a Nobel Prize winner, um, was W. E. Merner. He had degrees in electrical engineering, physics, and math when he graduated from Washington University. Of interest, his Nobel Prize is in chemistry, but none of his formal degrees were in chemistry. They were in physics, math, and, and engineering. So very early on, long ago, you know, this, you know, us allowing our students to combine things together is nothing new here. We've been doing it for a long time. Some examples of some of our recent grads in more traditional areas of engineering, Allison Todd, 
So she did her BS in electrical engineering, a minor in computer science, and a minor in ancient studies. I didn't even know that we had a minor in ancient studies until I was putting the slide deck together. So there's a wide variety of different things that students can do like that. Um, she is now working in Albuquerque with Boeing with their laser and electrical optical systems department. Kalichi was our in-council president. I mentioned in-council earlier today when he was a student here. Had degree, a degree in mechanical and a minor in robotics. He is now working outside of Chicago in, um, as, in the underwriter laboratories. And he's the lead designer for various test equipment for all of North America. Now, thinking about more non-traditional things, that bigger picture things that students can do. When Nicole was here, chemical engineering, she went to med school, doctor now, and now she is a doctor on an air ambulance. So I can't even imagine what that would cost. A regular ambulance ride is pretty expensive. I can't imagine what they'd charge you if you had to have an air ambulance ride. So if you're in the, in the California area and an air ambulance is out there picking you up, and Nicole might be the doctor in that helicopter that's there to help you get to the hospital okay. Um, Bob Binken, he is astronaut, but not only an astronaut, he was the chief of the astronaut office at NASA. And a couple of years ago, his name was big in the news when they had a flight take place, which hadn't taken for a while. And one of two astronauts that took off from the US that year. Oh, excellent. Um, and for, we, we do have a lot of athletes here in engineering. I personally love the engineering athletes because the factors that make for a good engineering student make for a good athlete. They're good time managers, they're team players, they're willing to ask for help if they need to ask, if they need help. So um, Ryan went off and signed a contract with the St. Louis Cardinals. We all know the best baseball team um, in our country. Aaron Lawrence, uh, energy engineering student, uh, actually chemical engineering, and she won an international award for her work. She works for General uh, Motors, and she is figuring out how to integrate the charging systems into the electrical grid across the country. If you saw Apollo 13, um, older movie with um, Tom Hanks as the lead actor, and Ed Harris was the flight director in that, who was directing that from ground control. Well, one of our current graduates is currently in that role as flight director, uh, Fiona Turrent. Fiona was very active here as an undergraduate student, and now she is the 100th flight director of NASA. Kendall, I remember Kendall very well when she was a um, biomedical engineering student here. She was born disabled with spina bifida and uh, went off and has now been a multiple gold medal winner in Olympics um, around the world. Uh, my favorite, actually, though, I, that I like to talk about is John Brooke. Um, when, you, when you look to see what John accomplished here as an undergrad, he, was, he had a full tuition Langsdorf scholarship, um, you know, mechanical engineering, BS, a master's degree in mechanical engineering, a minor in aerospace, a minor in electrical engineering, a minor in robotics, a minor in music. Do you think this guy was headed for NASA? You know, wouldn't you? Amazing. He is the head backpacking ranger at Denali National Forest in Alaska. And the reason I love this slide to show it to the, to the students is that a lot of them maybe wanted to be a, a park ranger or something when they were kids growing up. The parents said, no, you can't do that. You won't make any money doing that or it's a terrible career field. Well, um, I, I, I don't know what kind of money John makes them, just to be honest. And I don't know how his parents feel about him doing this job. But I am Facebook friends with him, and I constantly see pictures like this. Uh, he's married to another park ranger. He and his wife are constantly enjoying life. And ultimately, that's what's most important. I mean, the engineering degrees are great. They provide opportunities. Ultimately, though, we want people to be happy. We want our sons and daughters to be happy and enjoy their lives. And, and John is doing that. So um, on the positive side that we like to talk about engineering is that engineers tend to make the highest starting salaries in terms of undergraduate degrees earned. Now, this is something that does make the parents happy, and it makes a lot of the students happy, too, when they realize how much money they're going to be making when they graduate. So this is the breakdown of the incoming class coming in for engineering compared to the other majors. Arts and sciences is by far the biggest group of students that come in every year. 
And then we're the second biggest and then business and art and architecture. And then we have a program called Beyond Boundaries and eventually those students will move into the schools from their Beyond Boundaries areas. So the, um, what, what's fascinating, well, about 14% of our class might be engineering coming in. At graduation time, it'll be closer to 20% of that graduating class four years from now will be engineering. We're a net importer of students. So we have more students that transfer into engineering every year than transfer out. We'll typically have around 70 students transfer into engineering in a semester and only around 20 or 25 that will transfer out. So um, that's a, that's a, we, we love that. We love having more actually graduate than came in as first year students. In terms of the breakdown of the class that's coming in this year, you know, most, you know, most engineering schools, it's only 18 to 22% women in engineering. We're at 41% this year. We were 41% last year. We're almost always above 30%. We look at our underrepresented students and we combine and look at and or female and or underrepresented students. We're at 60% of our class. So very diverse group of students here. We're very proud of that. 28% Pell. 20% first gen. I was a first generation college student going to college. A number of the folks in our office were first gen. We have programming for them to help them land and be more successful here. So a third of our class coming in this year is either Pell and our first generation. Our international number is, is a bit lower this year for it fluctuates anywhere from five to 10%. And we are um, a bit lower this year compared to some other years. Now, I, I, I almost hesitate to show the slide because it's somewhat meaningless because it's a starting point and these numbers will change so much in the next year or so. And Aaron mentioned that students will switch around. So the, um, you know, for sure we'll have more students that'll move towards the electrical and systems area as time goes on and we'll have more people that'll come in. So um, this number doesn't mean a lot right now. It's only a starting point. The, uh, it is, we do like to emphasize the, the challenges that students will have here as students in terms of the amount of work that they'll have to do. They're all fully capable. We really truly believe every single student we admit can make it here in engineering. There will be moments when your sons and daughters won't feel that way. Please give them the encouragement to use the resources um, to, to get through and that culture of support that starts with our office, Engineering Undergraduate Student Services in LaPata 303. And we're gonna emphasize that a lot with them tomorrow. If they're not sure where to go for help, come and talk to their four-year advisor. We don't have all the answers, but we certainly know all the people on, on campus that can help them with the questions that they might have. So we want them to be able to use us. We want, we want to be the, the life cycle contact for your sons and daughters the entire time that they're with us. Our office has a lot of helpful websites. Our, our website has a lot of helpful links that they can use. This is a, a listing of our four-year advisors in our office. So if any of the four-year advisors that are here, please we're at, uh, please stand and, and raise your hand, if you would, please, at this time. We've got a few of them here today. We have some new ones. So. Um, we've added five advisors. We really have added three, two of them are replacements. We had two of our folks in our office poached away by other offices on, on campus in the last year, which is, I, I don't take that as a negative because we have some awesome people in our office When other places see them, they want them. So they do attract them away at times, but we have hit it out of the park in terms of the people that we've hired. So everyone we've hired has between 10 and 20 years of advising experiences at other, other institutions. You know, I, I often think of an office as like a, a bowl of soup that's constantly boiling and simmering. And every time you add somebody new, it adds a new flavor to it. And it makes the whole thing taste a little bit different. So we were very careful in terms of the people that we hired. We have a very in-depth selection process. In fact, one of the candidates said it was the most um, thorough selection process she's ever been through. And we wanna make sure there's that right fit. The most important thing for us is that, the, that that person has a genuine interest in caring for students and wanting that student to be successful while they're here. Everything else, the technical stuff, we can train them over time, but we can't train that genuine caring for people. 
James is kind of off to the right there and off on his own because he hasn't officially started with us yet. He starts next Friday with our office. He has been with Student Financial Services here at Washington University for close to 20 years. We have worked with James on hundreds of student issues in that time. He has always been so responsive and helpful that when the opportunity came to get him to our office, we immediately jumped on it and took it. So there's other people though in our office that students get help with uh, when they come in the door and we'll talk more about them with your sons and daughters tomorrow, along with our registrars. And our registrars are the ones who handle the transfer credit, the AP credit, degree clearance, everything related to their academic record. So we've got five people here to help them with that. So students are also will be assigned a faculty member while they're here. And for every program they have, whether it's a, a degree program, a second major or minor, they'll have a faculty member who's a specialty in that discipline um, available to talk to the students. So we want the students to come and talk to us for anything general. And uh, we can also then uh, uh, go into the specifics if we need to, but the faculty member is really there to help the student with that academic program and also talk about possible career options uh, for that particular major. There are a lot of resources here. If you if you're here at the session before this one, you saw the Chancellor and Ana Gonzalez and Rob Weil talk about the different things that are available on campus. There is no reason for a student not to get the help that they need while they're here. Sometimes they have to be willing to ask for it though. And that's where we're constantly trying to figure out how do we know when students might be heading for trouble when they're not coming to talk to us. And we have a whole student support leg in our office now that's really thinking about that. What are some analytics or things that with some data points that we can have to help us better predict who might be getting into trouble if they're not coming in to talk to us? Uh, the mental health resources, uh, there are a lot of resources here on campus. These are the ones just within Washington University on campus itself, but there's also additional off-campus resources that are available that we'll cover. Um, you heard about timely care earlier, encouraging your sons and daughters to go ahead and register for that early on. That way, when it comes time, if they need help, they can use uh, timely care. Orientation has been designed. Uh, we, we get the students for about three days in terms of covering the engineering related things. And everything that we cover is really designed to help them be successful, not only for their first few weeks on campus, but for their entire four years to kind of introduce them to things. So. We'll meet with them Monday morning at 10 o'clock. We have a first gen lunch. 20% of our students are first gen. We'll have a special lunch for them. First gens have a unique situation where they often just don't even know who to ask for help. And in terms, you know, the, their, their parents didn't go to college. They don't have a lot of help. So we're trying to get them connected even more so than some of the other students. Career Center panel, uh, Jennifer Finney's here. She'll be part of the panel here uh, in, in Kelly DeFalls. They um, are, tied into the career aspects and we want the students to know very early on what are the career options for them what when when should they sign up for internships getting their uh, going to the career fairs and things like that and then we'll also then meet with them um, in small group advising meetings on monday afternoon this is i think is one of the most important and sometimes overlooked opportunities the students have at their disposal and this is when we'll often see students change their majors we have an opportunity for him, for them to go to every single faculty department or every department with faculty, and they can hear from the department chair and the faculty in those groups about what it's like to major in that particular area. We have it set up so they can go to every single event if they want to, every single session. We really encourage them to go to as many of these as possible. Please encourage them. This is their chance. I mean, they really won't have a chance like this, quite like this again, where in one day they can get exposed to all the different areas of engineering in one shot going from one to the other. And then on Wednesday, we have a pre-med meeting since we do have a, a pretty good percentage of students as Dean Bobbick mentioned, who have an interest in medicine when they come in. Um, our current student panel is one of the most highly rated every year. So we'll, we'll have a panel of students in a situation like this. The first years will come in, they'll sit down, all of us will leave the room. So there won't be any administrators in the room and it gives the, the students a chance to talk to other students about what life is really like there for them. And then we have a combined studies meeting uh, where if students have an interest in, in pursuing things across campus, they can learn more about that. And then the following Monday, we have an activity fair, a career fair with an ice cream truck where we have all the different student groups 
give a little pitch about their groups within McKelvey, about what it's like to be a member and encouraging them to join. Engineering has the most active student groups on campus. And the, uh, we want them to get involved very early on if they can. Um, sampling of all the different things that students can get involved in here as undergraduates, which you may have already heard. Some outstanding affinity groups that exist for, for our students like Nesby and, um, and SWE. The, we have over um, 20 different student groups within engineering. A lot of hands-on groups that, that really, I think it's great if they can get involved in like the, the race car team on the top right, where the students build a race car from scratch every year. Uh, there are companies who come here and specifically look for students who've been on that teams. SpaceX is an example where we have a number of alums who work for SpaceX. They give preference to those students who've worked on a hands-on team before. And honestly, I've been a bit shocked at some of the students they've hired with the low GPAs because the students spend all their time working on that team and, but they would rather have a student with that hands-on experience rather than somebody with a high GPA who's never had any hands-on experience on an engineering type project. Our design build fly team now known as Washu Flight Club, um, they, where they have to build something that can fly and they compete nationally with it. We have a rocket team, Wu Rocketry, their very first year out in 2021. They won three awards, uh, three awards that first year, the Rookie Team Award, the STEM Engagement Award, and the Reusable Launch Vehicle Award. The, we have students that do a lot of international related things, Engineers Without Borders, and here was a group of students that went to Uganda this summer to train transportation workers. Like you go there and you need a, instead of a taxi, you might jump the back of a, of a motorcycle. So they've changed, they've trained these motorcycle um, drivers on basic first aid since it's so hard to get help right away there if someone has an accident. Um, entrepreneur related things, Joe Beggs. Now, Joe is actually one of our dual degree uh, students from Grinnell College. That's a whole different um, area that we offer here um, that I won't go into, but uh, you know, Joe, it's a great example of developing a medical device that he is now seeking to get FDA approved. And he started this project when he, he was an when undergraduate student here in a student group. He has graduated. Study abroad. We have a variety of places that students can go to. Most of these are English speaking programs, even if they're not in English speaking countries. The challenge we have is that most engineering students are not fluent in a foreign language because they've spent all their time doing math and science. Uh, thermodynamics is hard enough in English compared to Spanish or French or German. So they usually have to go to an English speaking program, but we do encourage them to go abroad if they can. The research has shown that people are more creative if they've had an international experience. When they get exposed to a different culture, they look at themselves differently. They look at the world differently when they've actually been immersed in a different area. Uh, we do have a really cool engineering summer in London program that we encourage students to go to after their first year. And they can knock out differential equations as one of their classes if they want to do that. Melanie is the one who created this program for us and who managed it. And Andrew uh, is also with her now that helps with those uh, programs. So there's my email address. If you ever need to email me, feel free to take a picture of it if you'd like. And I'm going to actually call up our panel now to come up and we want to answer your questions. Let's see how much time do we have left. We still have a good half hour, so it's great. I think we've got you till noon. We've got 35 minutes. Panel, please come on up. We'll have each person introduce themselves and I'm gonna ask for your questions then and then we'll direct it to the panel member who can best answer it for you. So Sarah, do you wanna start us off? Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I am a student here. Um, I guess I'm a junior now. I'm double majoring in biomedical engineering and computer science. Um, I'm also the president of Society of Women Engineers. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Ron Lowey. I am one of the four-year advisors, which means I spend a lot of my time meeting individually with students and walking them through all the resources and some of the academic classes they'll be taking. I also oversee the engineering dual degree program and the pre-medicine program. So if your students have an interest in pursuing a career in medicine, uh, they'll be seeing me the next four years. 
Hello, my name is Melanie Osborne, and I've been here on campus for almost 25 years. And for eight of those years, I was the in the orientation office. So I understand how tired your students might be at the end of the week. It's, it's a long week and a lot of activities. My primary job, like Ron's, uh, like all of us, is advising. We are there to work with your students all four years. The other things I do are study abroad, mentor programs, and um, well, I guess I kind of oversee advising. Hi, I'm Jennifer Finney. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an alum of the School of Engineering and I work in the Career Center now. Um, so I worked first as an engineer, but now I use that experience to help your children and students find um, their opportunities, both in school and then after they graduate. Hello, uh, my name is Kelly Delfoss and I lead industry relations for the School of Engineering. And I'm working mostly on the external side, building relationships with companies to recruit our students, connect with our student groups, uh, work with our faculty, both in the classroom and through research. So uh, I've been in an engineering school my entire career. I've been at WashU four years now. And that's, I think the exciting thing about uh, being an engineering student is all of the career opportunities that students have. And so we'll do different panels and things throughout the semester to help students see what they can do with their engineering degree. You know, one thing I want to mention very quickly that I meant to mention when the slide was up with the new advisors posted, there aren't many places that get to hire additional advisors. In fact, a lot of universities are cutting out more staff members because of cost constraints. And Aaron Bobick is incredibly oriented towards the undergraduate experience. It's important for parents to know because at a lot of research one institutions, the deans really only care about the graduate students. And he's the one who approved us to hire more advisors for more support for uh, your sons and daughters. So it's important for you to know that there's a lot of investment and interest in seeing them be successful here. So who has the very first question? Yes. Yeah, so what to expect about grades and grade distributions in the College of Engineering? Well, so first I'll mention that almost all your courses that your sons and daughters are taking their first year is in arts and sciences. So math, uh, physics, chemistry, and the humanities and social sciences, those are almost all arts and sciences courses. The students will be taking some intro courses their first year within McKelvey. The faculty have the control in terms of how grades are done. So there is not a standard template to really explain how it's done. You know, some faculty will, there's homework and there's exams and quizzes. There might be group projects that go into it and others might have three exams that they give that semester, and then that's what the final grade is based upon the average of those three grades. So it, it is really highly variable. Uh, Aaron, anything you wanna to add to that? It's 20, yeah, 20. 20 valedictorians. You may ask, how do you have 20 valedictorians? Well, they all have 12. So if you all, well, I will tell you the distribution of their majors is not uniform across all majors. So without going into detail, I'll say it's because in some departments, um, grade distributions are a little bit different than others. You do not give out rankings uh, at the end, so you don't have, you know, three of them or whatever. So we do we do ask the asking departments to send us the list of the students that didn't perform as well on their first exams and throughout the first semester. 
so that we can reach out to those students and let them know about the resources available to help them here, like our free tutoring program. I saw a hand over here. The internship space is very competitive, um, as you know. Resources that you have or of support for freshmen getting internships either through the school or through the entire school or through um, engineering. Um, just if you can talk a little bit about that, because I know a lot of companies start looking at internships and for interns in September and co-ops. I'm sorry, yeah, internships and co-ops in September and October. And that's very early, especially for people who haven't done this before. That's what we that's what we do in the Career Center is that we will help uh, your students with that process. Um, I do like to emphasize that all first year students don't need to get an internship. Um, we want first year students to have a meaningful experience next summer. We don't want them to go back home and play video games, um, but it doesn't need to be an internship. You saw that awesome study abroad in England. There's all the student group things. Um, so many good ways for them to spend their summer. Some of them will take classes, but some of them will get internships. Um, so if that's what their focus is, definitely jumping in early on can be helpful. Um, we do have career fairs, both the all-campus career fair and then the engineering spotlight will both be in September. So if that's what they're thinking, they want to keep those in mind. Again, no pressure. All students don't need to be at that their first semester. There'll be more career fairs next spring. And that may be a more appropriate time after they've gotten settled in and, and thought about it. But yeah, absolutely. Your students already have access to make appointments with us to use our job and internship database handshake. Um, so encourage them to reach out. Um, and we have a lot of ways for them to get in. If they do try to schedule with us and they're having any trouble, they should send an email and we'll direct them for various ways we can help them. Um, but we would love to see them all, not necessarily the first week. I encourage them not to see me the first week, get adjusted to classes, but maybe come and see us before they go home at winter break. Um, but again, if they're really eager to start now, we'll help them now as well. You know, a lot of times when I talk to my advisees and about their summer things that they might want to do, and I suggest that you might think about doing a study abroad your first summer and to get that under your belt and to get that breadth of uh, a global perspective. Second summer, maybe a research experience with a faculty member that's paid or for credit. And you get, uh, we, we think research here is great for students to do if they can involve that with a faculty member. That's where new knowledge is created. And it's also an opportunity for students to think about if they might want to go off and get a PhD. And one of the challenges that we have in getting our students to go off and, and pursue PhD programs is they make so much money with an undergrad degree, they don't really want to live with, you know, poverty level for another four or five years to work on a PhD when they could be out making a lot of money um, with an undergrad degree. But if we can get that research bug under their skin earlier on, they might consider going off and getting a PhD if that's a good fit for them. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I was just going to add. Um, you mentioned the recruiting cycle where a lot of companies hire students in, you know, September and October for the following summer, and that definitely does happen. And I think one of the things that Jennifer's office and the Career Center can do is help students understand those timelines, but also the companies and when they hire. So the bigger companies, you know, the, the tech companies and the ones that can predict their needs for next summer are the ones that are recruiting in the fall. But there's gazillions of other companies that you know hire through all out the year a lot of the small company startups that have last minute needs going into the summer so I, I think a first year internship is reasonable you might not get your dream intern that first year but you know maybe starting at a smaller company and getting that experience so you can get into a bigger company the next year I think companies all have different needs for hiring interns sometimes it's to funnel right into a full-time role sometimes it's to help a company with a small project so the opportunities do exist and in addition to everything Jennifer said we have a really strong mentoring network uh, there's different mentoring programs there's an online university platform where students can connect with alumni so as long as they're paying attention and taking advantage of all these resources I think it's it's totally feasible yeah We focus on figuring out something meaningful to do during that summer, but you know, then we get an internship. Some of these main main things. 
The other thing is to remember that it's part of the goal of the internship to also learn what they don't understand. Uh, so it's, it's not necessary that it's a specific work of job. It's necessary that internships for folks in a better position to know what they want to do and also understand the job value. Talking to folks uh, who have a specific expertise. Yes. Here's a mic if you'd like to use the mic. Okay. Um, so this class coming in had a, most of their high school was affected by COVID. Um, and I think that was really different across the country, um, whether kids were full time in school or not. So, uh, for example, our son, his whole almost his whole junior year was remote. Um, and taking some of these classes with no labs, um, I was just wondering. What, if anything, are you doing to maybe catch kids up or support them if they're behind because their high school maybe wasn't doing what some other high schools were doing? Yeah, it's a great question because it's also true of our students here where they were all remote basically for a year. So our seniors, juniors that are here had that same experience in their first few years where we were not in-person classes for the most part. So we do have a general division of Engineering Education, Jay Turner, who wasn't able to be here today, but it is he is the Vice Dean for Engineering Education. He has the contact. Uh, Jay and I meet every week, and we coordinate our efforts and our communication across our areas to make sure what our office is doing is there to support also the education area. I know that this is a topic that he thinks about and is working with the academic departments on. I'll just... Okay. Uh, and I'll also say that uh, high school experiences are tremendously varied. We've admitted your students because of their capacity, their aptitude, and typically demonstrated ability to focus on their work. We don't make a lot of assumptions about the strength of their high school education. So for the most part, they're going to be fine. Chris is right. Our actual bigger challenge, I mean, you know, March 2020, uh, we, we had a week and a half of a spring break to go from fully here to fully remote, including laboratory courses. All right. And so that required us getting TAs and instructors to start doing them by video and, and get so <laughs> we got very creative about how to create that knowledge acquisition. But then we've had to follow that up with uh, the students in the more senior classes who didn't. It. So that's actually, that was for us, that was actually the bigger challenge. I'm not so worried about um, uh, the, the high school issue. Your stu the students who had to do things remotely, kind of interesting, because they're all here, so they were pretty successful at it. They actually learned a weird time management skill that students previously did not. So we'll see whether that will have any implication uh, uh, regarding how it works here. There's also a greater pressure on us now to make a variety of content available digitally. But if we do that, we better make sure that what goes on in class is value added, because otherwise nobody's going to come. And so that's a, I, I would say amongst the, the primarily in residence university, that is something that we're looking at now. We, we now all know our faculty now know how to do stuff they didn't know how to do before in terms of leveraging the remote and digital content. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a better way of using the in-class time than the sage on the stage mode that we used to have. The challenge is if we start requiring students to get content remotely, uh, you know, uh, electronically back in their dorms or whatever, that's four more hours. So the question is, well, what are they not doing, right? So, so it's, it's a challenge. But so that will actually, frankly, continue to, to evolve. Nice thank shirt, you. by the way. Oh, thank you. Good promotion. <laughs> New shirt. Thank you. Uh, related question. First of all, it's great to see the investment that's been made in advising and support for the students. That's a fantastic investment and very different from what we see across the nation. In that same vein, knowing that these first courses they're going to take in any engineering program are typically the most intimidating, daunting, and the ones where they are probably in the largest classes they're ever going to have, math, physics, chemistry, and so forth. Can you talk a bit about what you're doing in terms of just undergraduate teaching 
to make sure stuff gets in, mm -hmm. especially in those intimidating, daunting first few courses that tend to be huge. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the good news is, is that the engineering students are mixed in with all the arts and sciences students with the physics, the math, and the chemistry, and the engineering students are typically some of the smartest kids in the class. So they're the ones that are often setting the, the, um, the bar. So there are often a bit less intimidated compared to some of the business majors or other majors that might be taking those classes. The, um, the education, Dean Bobbick, anything you'd like to mention about that? Yeah, yeah so, so a, a couple of things. One is over the last, to give uh, tremendous credit to my colleagues in ArtSci, over the last, uh, even before I got here, et cetera, there has been uh, a lot of work on developing smaller group learning. So they have these, um, uh, what do they call them, PLT, uh, PLT, mm -hmm. in, in chemistry, et cetera, where, 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 they, where they break out. Uh, physics has sort of gotten uh, a little bit better on that as well. So we keep pushing because every now and then I just mention, well, you know, maybe engineering, we could teach physics to our own students. And I just say that, and that causes a ripple because there's student credit hour tuition dollars that follow the students. So if you're the art side dean, the idea that engineering would start teaching physics is not so exciting. Um, but but to be honest, they've, they've worked really well at trying to continue to improve that. The other thing that we have, it, it flew past on the, on the slide, um, we provide within engineering for engineering students peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. It is free to the students, uh, we pay, et cetera. It is only available to the engineering students which is somewhat annoying to the non-engineering students who are friends of the engineering students who are struggling in that calculus class and the engineering students get to avail themselves of a peer-to-peer -peer tutoring system that we have set up. Um, I would say the challenge, and Chris has been doing this much longer, the challenge our students have that caused them to decide this isn't for them in those early is not because they're having trouble getting the content. They just decided, frankly, you know, I was on this train and I've been on this train since I was a sophomore in high school. And I got here and I realized, I don't really know or care where this train is headed. I would like another train, please. And, and they, you know, it's the mm -hmm. first time they've been allowed the space to ask themselves that question. Melanie, do you want to mention think about the PST groups, problem solving teams? Sure. In engineering, in addition to the peer led team learning PLTs for chemistry, physics, and math that Dean Bobbick mentioned, within engineering, we have problem solving teams. They're called PSTs for our entry class in electrical and systems engineering, in biomedical engineering, and in chemical engineering. And our faculty train students who have taken those classes to lead problem solving teams where students actually sit down with the student who knows the material and they do the homework. So we are helping those students, they're together in small groups. The students are learning the material with a student trained by the faculty who knows what's important for that intro course. And they're, they're very successful. Like 99% of the students sign up for the PSTs. They really help a student get through engineering and they teach them that working together with another engineering student or in small groups is really the best way to get through engineering. We also have a, a math help room that's open throughout the week that's staffed by math graduate students that we have a collaboration with the math department that students can walk in and get help whenever they need it during the week um, with their math homework. So, and, um, okay. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. First of all, I just wanna say to all of you, you are a breath of fresh air on a day that's so hard for so many parents, your humor and your clear passion for what you do in caring for our students is so appreciated. So thank you for that. Um, my, I have a two-parter. The first one is, uh, on average, how many credits do the engineering students tend to take each semester? 7,000. 
perfect. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. <laughs> no slacking. Um, and the my second part, I know we're in the minority, but our son had buyer's remorse almost immediately after applying to school, realizing he knew he wanted to be an engineer. So he's one of those kids who's transferring in um, at the semester. And Mr. Lowey, you've been talking to our son, and I thank you for your help. But can you talk just a little bit about how that transfer process works, how the kids can still get integrated when they aren't getting to do the creed or get their cute little gray hat? How, you know, what what all happens in that process? Ron, do you want to talk about that since you sure. led that? Effort? Sure, absolutely. And uh, amount of credits, it's somewhere between 15 and 7,000, right? So maybe closer <laughs> to 15 for the first part of that, that question. So indeed, students who are in uh, another school, College of Arts and Sciences or Business, Art and Architecture, they do have the opportunity to transfer over to McKelvey. And really the key is the transfer part is not that difficult. It's a matter of making sure that you're taking the right classes uh, your first year to make sure that you stay on track. Or if there's a case where a student decides later in their first year that they want to transfer over, they they maybe haven't had class that they need like physics, we might work over the summer of how they can how they can take that uh, over the summer. And one of the things we, we find really important that here in Engineering Student Services, we will advise uh, students who are interested whether they are in the School of Engineering or not. It's really important that we connect them to those resources. So uh, it sounds like I've had conversations already and we've probably talked with some uh, about some classes. Um, I may have a meeting with your son on Wednesday if it's the one I'm thinking of. Um, but uh, uh, that that process of making sure they're they're in the right classes. There are some classes in uh, computer science or business and computer science where there's some prerequisites and some benchmarks that students need to meet before they can transfer, and we'll go over that as well. The bottom line is we want a student to be successful, right? And so making sure that they're connected with the resources and taking the right class that ensures that they have success when they eventually do come over to uh, McKelvey. Thank you. If we didn't mention it, our weather is like this year round here in St. Louis too, like it is today, so. Yeah, so uh, my daughter took uh, some of the diagnostic tests in Leso and, uh, you know, she made it through, through them and the question I had is, what is the risk of overshooting and biting off more than she could have uh, chewed? And that's, I think, a conversation with your daughter's four-year advisor would be the best thing to do to kind of get a feel and engage on individual basis. Every student is is individually unique, and having us have a, a better understanding of what um, what she's doing, you know, her background, and what she might be concerned with. I will say that I think most of our diagnostic tests are pretty conservative. So they don't recommend that students move forward unless that test indicates they are probably ready to move forward. I'll also say one of the things I tell students, it's actually okay to take a course that's an easy A. You'll have plenty of courses that won't be. And uh, so they should be somewhat you know, picky. Um, and I would encourage all of you to tell them that it's okay to take their time uh, there will be a, I mean, we have students, no kidding, who will take seven courses in a semester because they want to collect, you know, 12 pieces of paper. And some of them can manage that. For a lot of them, it, that was the overreach, actually. The overreach is not accelerating too quickly. It's taking too much. So, you know, a little bit of patience is a good thing. The other thing that they're going to find out is that 24 hours a day is a lot of time and they're going to piss away most of it. And so, you know, early on, it would be really good for them to sort of ease into it and they can accelerate later and they will during their, their second half of their sophomore year, especially their junior year and their senior year. Uh, you know, we have a lot of students who go into our BSMS program, so they get a master's. Most of them can finish it in less than, by most of them less than the full year. Yeah, a lot of them take just one extra semester. Just one extra semester because they've already started taking the graduate courses during their senior year. And so for one more semester, which by the way, if they do well during their undergraduate is highly discounted tuition, like up to 50%. So for one semester of a highly discounted uh, semester, they end up with a master's degree. That's a pretty good deal. Um, but that typically happens because they've put their foot down on the accelerator during their junior year. So that's really the time for them to think about that. 
please. Um, I do want to say we have, my older son is also a BME. My daughter is also, didn't want to go in the brother's route, but still went in that. So I do realize how difficult it is. Having said that, how easy or difficult it is to do these double majors and minors and so on, because he, he did something completely different as a minor. So in a, I mean, minor or a major in another engineering program. Yeah, the, um, I'll let Melanie take it in just a second, but I'll just also mention that a lot of times, while we see a lot of our students getting second majors and minors, a lot of times when we're actually talking to the students, we're saying, do you really need that second major or minor? No one is gonna care when you graduate how many minors you had or second majors. Maybe taking some courses in that area is a, a better way to spend your time and not going so deep in it that no one's really, it's not gonna matter. Our engineering degree programs have core courses and then they have elective courses built into them. Often the elective courses dovetail with the minors that they may be interested in. For example, if you're um, mechanical engineering and you want an energy minor, a lot you can take your electives in the energy minor and uh, that works very nicely to complete minors. Like Dean Kroger said though, there needs to be a reason to have a minor, uh, but Sarah is actually doing that. So I'm gonna let a real live student explain how that works. Okay, yeah. So I'm double majoring in biomedical engineering and computer science. Um, and so I think like, it's not super difficult to get a double major, but it's just like, you have to plan ahead for it. Um, so when I was a freshman, what I did was just make an Excel sheet of like all the requirements I needed to do and like planned out kind of what I wanted to do. Um, and so for me, I decided to like try and balance like harder classes in one major with like maybe easier ones in another. Um, and I do know a lot of like other en engineering students who have like one or two minors or a second major. So it definitely is doable if you want to, but um, make sure you like before you actually go down that path that you're interested in both things. And all of our students have to take at least 18 units in humanities and social sciences. They get to choose at least six must be social science, at least six must be humanities. But it's not that hard for a student if they want to get something in arts and sciences to use those, to double count those humanities and social science units towards that minor outside of engineering. Hi, can you um, talk a little bit about the summer uh, abroad programs and what the deadlines are um, and the dates for those and when more information will be available on those programs? Sure, the information is available all the time on the Overseas Programs website. And then you can search that by engineering and you'll see the programs that we offer. If a student wants to study abroad in the spring, which spring of junior year is the most popular time for our students to study abroad, although there are other opportunities and great options, um, that deadline is May 1st of the next year. So a student who needed to, uh, wants to study abroad in spring 2023 had to have applied in May deadline of 2022. If you want to study abroad in the summer or the fall, that deadline is February 1st. So the, for summer, a student can study abroad and do anything. There's all kinds of programs. You can just go to University of Sussex in England and, and just take some fun courses, spend the summer there. That's just one example. There are all kinds of humanities and social science programs. There are a couple of places where a student in the summer could do engineering coursework. We have a great partnership with a university called John Cabot University in Rome, and students can take a couple courses in engineering there, and who doesn't want to spend the summer in Rome? And, we, and then our summer in London program is designed uh, for students who are going to be sophomores there are either three or six units they can take there. Andrew and I work with students all year long. Andrew, raise your hand. Uh, Andrew and I work with students all summer long and we are happy to talk to students about 
any of the opportunities. A couple of the programs that we have were started because a student came in and said, I don't see a program in this place. Can we do that? And we worked it out and now we have a vibrant program. So we have a really cool way for students to sign up for us on our website, Engineering Undergraduate Student Services. If you click on the, on the staff page, all of our photos are listed there and there's a way for students to sign up for an appointment with us either in person or by Zoom. And so that they can sign up you know, weeks in advance to meet with us if they want to. So I would wait a few weeks before they talk to us about study abroad. We'll be dealing with a lot of schedule changes in the next couple of weeks with students, but anytime after say three weeks from now would be a great time to sign up with Andrew and, and Melanie for study abroad. Yes. Hi. Front row. Good afternoon. <laughs> Front row. Yes. Well, Nicole, my daughter, was uh, accepted at the joint program, the joint degree program for business and computer science. I don't hear much about it. I have been talking to some of the parents out there. I'm surprised that she's doing both. My concern is more like Nicole was always looking at computer science, but she got accepted to this program that I think is an amazing opportunity for her because that's what we're looking at in the future, you know people that are preparing both disciplines. But what about if you wanna just go back to computer science, say, hey, I don't wanna do business. Honestly, I don't see myself there. Can she do it or she have to finish that program in four years and then, you know, thank you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So <clears throat> first of all, no, she does not need to finish that program or stay in that program if she wants to change maybe to a straight computer science uh, program. Uh, or major, but but I will say in the joint business and computer science program, which is a, a joint program between the Olin School of Business and, and McKelvey Engineering, there's a lot of flexibility within that program to take maybe more of your electives within computer science, maybe a few more on that side and still get that, that business aspect. So the first semester in that program, there's a, a seminar that goes over all the resources within this business and computer science joint program. And I think after that first semester, um, your student will have a better sense of maybe what direction um, they'll wanna go, which is of course common for all the majors as we've talked about that things kind of shift. And that's, that's really why we're here as an office to help talk students through that process of learning what their interests are and then maybe giving suggestions of the direction they want to go. So the answer is yes, they could switch. Andrew raise his hand yeah. again. Andrew, raise your hand. Yep. <laughs> yep. And Andrew is uh, taking over as the advisor for the, the business and computer science program. I thought that she will have to be the advisor, not the business side. But then we find out that it was Andrew, and I think it's great because that's exactly right very collaborative between Olin so if there's a question Andrew doesn't know his counterpart in, in the business school he'll talk to well I think our time is up today it's almost 12 o'clock I this is Can always for my one what <laughs> yes okay one more yes Thank you. Hi, thank you all. This is really wonderful and great to see the multitude of, of support. This is kind of a question for Sarah, I think. Um, we've heard a lot about all the resources and as a parent, our kids don't always listen to what we have to say and what direction we should push them towards. So are there relationships that we can encourage our kids to move toward their four-year advisor or other peers or whatever? And are there, are, is there information out there that's bad that they shouldn't listen to Reddit or, you know, I think that there's a lot of peer mentoring that happens and things like that. So, um, or are there myth buster sessions that, that we can push them towards? So there's tons of information, what's good, what's bad, and how can we guide them? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I guess like all the advisors are pretty helpful, um, but I think like really getting to know your four-year advisor will help a lot because like they can direct you to who you need to talk to. Um, but also like forming relationships with other students, I think has been the most helpful for me. Um, just like getting to know upperclassmen, um, they're probably the ones who've taken the courses that I'm interested in. So it's like really helpful to talk to them. Um, and I guess like just getting to know the other students in the classes is also super helpful. Cause like 
they know it, like they're going through the exact same things as you are. Um, but yeah, I think uh, just like getting to know the people that are closest to you that you'll be spending the most time with um, will help a lot. One caveat I'll make about the other students is that you saw that two thirds of the students are arts and sciences on campus and the arts and sciences students have different policies sometimes than engineering students do. So sometimes engineering students get panicked about when they hear of a policy, they hear from a roommate or somebody who's not engineering. So yeah, please encourage them to, to see the four-year advisor about verifying what they're hearing. Is that, is that Lisa there? Yeah. I'll be. Well, thank you for sending your, your second child here with us. I think I'm the advisor if I remember correct. Uh, thank you for being here today. This is always one of our favorite meetings to have. We'll hang around here if you have additional questions and we're happy to answer them. And we hope to see you at Parent Family Weekend coming up in October. Thank you.